so very good afternoon to all it is our great pleasure to welcome you all to the knowledge 4.0 webinar series so under, under knowledge 4.0 webinar series chennai uh, technology has been taking tremendous effort to enhance the knowledge of faculty members researchers and students community knowledge 4.0 webinar series one of the unique and distinct initiative of chennai for technology under the guidance of our honorable chairman sri p srinam who is one of the well known first generation successful entrepreneur industrialist managing director of mk group of companies under knowledge 4.0 we have been conducting webinar series such as technical webinar series research webinar series career guidance webinar series innovative talk webinar series and alumni webinar series apart from this we are also conducting uh, national and international conferences national and seminars workshops faculty development programs and in addition to that we have taken a new initiative as a lecture series uh, in a particular uh, topic so today we have dr uh, professor v balasubramanian uh, hod Man manufacturing engineering and uh, director of uh, c major with us so he is one of the well known person in welding and he is to take mbm uh, in excellent manner so he is going to deliver the lecture series uh, which will be from uh, 162017 2022 uh, 672020 uh, except sunday so totally 5 days will be uh, this lecture and it will be considered as one week lecture series on mechanical behavior of materials and so we have uh, we, we had a lot of requests from uh, different participants all over india so because of which uh, so I, when I requested with VB sir, so readily he has accepted. It is our uh, boon to have lecture uh, in uh, MBM from him. And uh, so when the course, is on, the course was announced, I got a lot of uh, uh, mails uh, through mails and uh, FB posts and uh, message through uh, his students. And uh, so we, we got a lot of appreciation to get him for the technical lectures. And I hope this lecture will be highly useful to the researchers and for those who want to enhance their knowledge in the mechanical behaviors. So when I was discussing this, I told that, so I had opportunity to learn mechanical behavior only I, when I was doing uh, my PhD in NIT Ritchie. Sir, the, so we should uh, explore our capabilities to other students, those who are interested to learn. So I, I had request with uh, uh, VB sir, readily he has accepted. So it is my great pleasure to welcome him for this wonderful forum, sir. And uh, I request all the uh, faculty members, even eminent professors from different uh, institute, government institute and uh, uh, all over India, they have joined with us. So I welcome you all along with the participants. Uh, and now I request uh, Ms. Varsa Sri, a student of second year mechanical, to introduce our VB sir, even though he does not require any introduction. Mm -hmm. So as a, a part of any uh, program, we ought to introduce. So can I request Ms. Varsa Sri to introduce our VP uh, Good evening, everyone. This is Varsha, pursuing second year mechanical engineering at Chennai Institute of Technology. Excellence is not being the best, it is doing your best. One such excellent person among us is Dr. V. Balasubramanian, professor in the Department of Manufacturing Engineer and also head and director in CMJ and RD at Annamalai University. It is PhD in the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He has about 27 years of experience in teaching as well as research. His research interest involves materials joining and surface engineering. He is a life member at Indian Welding Society, IWS, and Indian Institute of Welding, IIW. He has published about 400 research articles in national and international journals as well as conferences. We are very glad to have you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, please, you can uh, go out with your session, sir.
Is it uh, clear now? Yes, sir. Please, clear, sir. You can go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Dinagaran for uh, taking this initiative, uh, for giving a series of lectures on uh, mechanical behavior of materials. Another way. Ah, yeah. Where are the link and the number? Sorry, so, so today's uh, lecture it is uh, focused on uh, tensile behavior of materials. Yeah, in this uh, five lecture series, uh, I have planned to cover these topics one by one. The first lecture will be on uh, the basic, that is very, very, very important tensile behavior. Uh, the second lecture tomorrow it will be focused on uh, fitting behavior. And third lecture is uh, again on the execution of fitting behavior, that is the fitting crack growth behavior. And uh, fourth one is fracture toughness behavior. And lastly, the fifth lecture I will focus on crack toughness and creep behavior. So this is uh, my plan to cover the mechanical behavior of materials in the five lectures. Uh, usually the mechanical behavior of materials, we have a course in uh, PG, that's a um, uh, post graduation, manufacturing engineering or um, ME manufacturing engineering and ME welding engineering. I used to take this uh, entire MBM, uh, nearly 40 to 45 hours required. But anyway, I will try to cover this uh, within uh, uh, five hours or uh, something around six hours. So today, it's, uh, I plan to cover only on uh, tensile behavior. So though it is a uh, very basic uh, property of a material, tensile properties of material, uh, many people think that it is a very simple, simple property. Uh, why we should focus, why we should give uh, a more I emphasis on this property, especially on tensile property. So today I try to cover this uh, one by one. So maybe initially introduction, then uh, engineering stress strain curve, two stress strain curve, instability in tension, stress distribution of the neck, ductility, and the effect of strain rate on flow properties and the effect of temperature on flow behavior. So these are the some of the topics and very. Uh, relevant and very important as far as to understand the tensile behavior or tensile properties of the material. And um, if you take a tensile test, if you want to understand the tensile behavior or tensile property of material, then you should know about the tensile test. Uh, many people think tensile test is a very simple test. Uh, you take a specimen and then it, uh, you can uh, hold it in your uh, universal tensile testing machine UTM and uh, you break it so that's all uh, people think that it is a breaking load that is very much important it's not like that there are uh, 10 properties or 10 characteristics or 10 behavior of a material uh, can be measured or can be understood or can be analyzed using a simple tensile test if you do it properly if you don't do it properly, then you will not get, you will end up with only one or two uh, properties, which is listed out here. So starting from yield strength, tensile strength, fracture strength, these three are related to the strength alone. And then you have the ductility parameters, ductility property like the elongation, percentage of elongation, reduction in cross sectional area, and uh, Young's modulus. Young's modulus, stiffness, and toughness. These are also the derived properties from the tensile test. And finally, further extension of this tensile test, you can evaluate, you can determine strain hardening exponent of the material and also the strength coefficient of the material. So these are the 10 properties. Maybe there are two more properties or the 12, uh, one dozen properties, characteristics or behavior of the material one can get by doing a simple test 
as per the standards and as per the uh, as per the, the procedures prescribed by the standards if you don't follow those standards then it's uh, you will not get all the properties right normally you all uh, many of them are many of the attendees are uh, faculty members uh, working in engineering colleges and uh, you all know that so the tensile test can be done by using a utm universal tensile testing machine for just for uh, so some of the newcomers to this topic i just displayed here two different machines one machine is a screw driven machine you can say it is a mechanical machine at the left side the other one is the hydraulic machine uh, the hydraulic actuated machine uh, there are many varieties have come now electro mechanical machines also have come and uh, servo hydraulic machines also have come now but anyway if you want to do your uh, tensile test or if you want to evaluate the tensile behavior of a material then you need to have any one of this utm universal tensile testing machine so if you have utm then you can do straight away you can do the tensile properties using these machines and uh, yes again as i told there are uh, by operation there are the load control machines are there displacement control machines are there the difference is in load control machines you can control the load the loading rate per minute how much load you can apply that you can control in displacement control machines it is the the elongation you can control the displacement of the ramp you can control by any two methods you can get both the the, the tensile properties whatever i list out there you can find out and uh, as far as the specimen is concerned there are many standards are there normally people follow the ASTM standard ASTM E8 E8 standard is meant for the uh, ASTM E8 capital E and the 8 so that is meant for the uh, tensile testing so they follow universally it is the ASTM standard the American Society for Testing and Material that, that will be followed so here uh, there are uh, two specimens, two types of specimens normally involved in the tensile test. One is the round specimen, cylindrical specimen. The other one is, in most of the times, uh, the, if the, the material thickness is very less, then you cannot do the cylindrical specimens. In that case, you have to test as a sheet specimen or plate specimen, as it is. So you, either whatever the whether it is a cylindrical specimen or it is a sheet specimen or it is a plate specimen, you need to prepare the specimens as per the standards. So please refer the ASTM standards for uh, the specimen preparation. Mainly, the specimen preparation is very important thing here is the gauge length L O. That's a gauge length that is decided by the uh, the diameter of the specimen or the thickness of the specimen. So the gauge length L0, LO, that's initial gauge length. LO is nothing but initial gauge length that you have to mark after preparing the specimen. So the, the two ends, it is for holding purpose. So only here in the gauge length area, you are going to measure all the, the properties, properties of the material. So that region you have to mark specifically. Suppose you are marking 50 mm as the gauge length or 100 mm as the gauge length. So gauge length you can fix based on the length of the specimen. So with the length of the specimen, again, it was this, you can decide based on the machine capability. Some machines require 300 mm length. Okay, that's a conventional UTM, conventional UTM universal testing machines, hydraulic machines or screw driven machines. They require a longer specimens. But the recent time we have very uh, even tabletop uh, UTM machines have come. So those machines require even a small specimens like even 50 mm length you can do it. Even 50 mm length you can do it. We have one machine that is a tensor meter, which is a tabletop machine. In that you can you can you can measure or you can test even 25 mm one inch length specimens also. So based on the machines you can fix the machine capability you can fix the length of the specimen 
and the once the length is fixed total length then gauge length should be fixed based on the either diameter of the specimen if it is a cylindrical specimen or based on the thickness of the specimen if it is the if it is the sheet specimen or plate specimen so once the gauge length is fixed that gauge length should be marked on the specimen and then you hold the specimen firmly rigidly in the machine by clamping and then you select the loading rate you need to apply the load that load should be applied that's so the loading is applied based on the machine if it is a mechanical machine screw driven machine it's a mechanical load mechanical control and if it is electromechanical machines are there hydraulic machines are there so loading can be applied so the loading rate is very important because it's uh, as per the ASTM standard 1.5 kilo newton per minute so per minute so that much load you need to apply so that is the loading rate because you now you, if you apply the loading rate faster and then the strain rate will differ we will come to that little later what is strain rate and all so this uh, loading uh, loading rate should be very very small or otherwise you no know, the loading rate is higher then you will not get the uh, proper behavior of the machine so the loading rate you have to design and that should be normally it is fixed in the machine and you can vary the loading rate also some of the machines they have the you can vary the loading rate and once it is fixed then you apply the load and from the first stage to the second stage if you see that there is an elongation there is a extension of length elongation is changed you can see the specimen the second specimen when compared to the first specimen the second specimen is slightly longer so this longer is the arrow mark is noting that in the the position in the stress strain curve and the if you further increase the load keep on increasing the load apply the loading rate and then at the stage one stage is reached that is the specimen will neck necking means there is a reduction in the cross section area or the diameter the sudden reduction in the cross section area and after once the necking is formed then the necking is the maximum load the, the specimen can take the maximum load condition only the necking will start so beyond that 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 necking once the necking starts you can understand that the material is going to fail or going to fracture beyond that the load the machine cannot take the load further so the load start decreasing that's the stress in this curve you can understand that the necking point is the maximum load that can be carried by the specimen so after the necking load it is going to fail so that is then finally after some elongation some deformation the specimen will fail so that is the final point that is the fracture point so here you will get three different strength one is yield strength in the second specimen related to the second specimen or the yield strength means i will i'll come back to that little later just to understand so if your machine is having a capability to draw to construct this diagram stress strain diagram it's good so most of the machines conventional machines they don't have this provision they normally draw load versus displacement curve load versus displacement load in y axis and displacement in the x axis the load is the load applied on the specimen and the displacement is displacement of the ram so that the normally the all the machines will have this and now the the utm the machines are in integrated with uh, computers the computers they will take this load versus displacement graph and they convert the load into stress load into stress how they convert It's a simple formula, load by area. So you know the cross section area of the specimen, initial area. Initially, what is the diameter? The area is cross section area is pi by four d square. So using this formula, they call it the area. And load, what is applied load is known. So load by area is stress. So y-axis will be plotted in this stress. And similarly, the strain, the displacement, and that displacement is converted into you know the initial gauge length. and then the find the gauge length increment that will be taken care and the strain is calculated here change in length from the initial length 
how much length gauge length is changing, the quad changing. So that is the displacement by measuring displacement. The displacement is converted into strain, and you'll get the stress strain curve if the machine is integrated with a computer. That will do if you feed all this data. You have to feed the data. What is this initial diameter? What is the gauge length? And everything if you feed into that, so that will plot the, the machine is capable of plotting this type of stress strain. So if you, why I take this long, more time on this slide is there are uh, many parameters you can see that. So what is as far as the strength is concerned, three strength you can get yield strength, ultimate tensile strength, and fracture strength. And we we'll, I will come back to that. What is yield strength? What is the difference between yield strength and fracture strength or tensile strength? We'll come. Back, we'll discuss a little later. And then and as far as the uh, the elongation or the strain is concerned. There are the regions, you see that there is an elastic deformation region. So below yield point, that region is under the curve, is it called as this is the elastic deformation. And then you have the after that yield, yield strength. So the deformation is plastic, it's changing into the plastic deformation. And totally, the total elongation is from zero to end until the fracture point. That is the total strain. So you have elastic strain up to yield point, yield strength, and then you have plastic strain from yield point or yield strength to fracture strength. So that distance is called as the plastic strain. You can see in the x-axis, there are uh, three strains are given, elastic strain, plastic strain, and total strain. So some of this elastic strain and the plastic strain is total strain. So you can get the strength, three strength value, and the three strain values. And apart from that, you can get one more thing. It is the Young's modulus. Young's modulus, you know that it is the uh, stress by strain, stress by strain in the um, elastic region. Um, that is, you can get by measuring the slope of this curve, slope of the curve from the well, slope of the curve below the yield point. If you measure the slope of the curve, that is uh, dy by dx. Slope, you can measure dy by dx, change in y by change in x. That will give the n smallness. So this um, uh, six plus one, seven properties you can get using this uh, simple stress strain curve. Right. So further uh, explanation for that. Yeah. So the further explanation is um, the tensile stress. Okay. What is tensile stress? I told no, it is there are the three strengths, we'll see one by one. And the average longitudinal tensile stress is given by the load by area. P is nothing but load, which is acting on that this month. And then A naught, A naught is the uh, original, that's our in initial cross section area. Initial cross section area at gauge length. Don't take it as in the, uh, the fixer area. At the, gauge length area, what is the initial cross-section cross area. So that is, if you know that initial cross-section area and the maximum P, P is the maximum tensile stress, maximum load that the material is standing uh, before failure, that is the P, P by A is the average longitudinal tensile stress. And similarly, average linear strain, because the, we are measuring the strain in the linear direction, not in the diameter direction. We are not measuring in the uh, diameter direction. Here we are measuring only in the linear direction, length direction. So in the length direction, what is the initial gauge length? You take only the gauge length. Don't people sometimes know they measure the entire length of the specimen. It is not required. So you have to measure the elongation in the gauge length. As I told you, the gauge length should be marked before testing the specimen. How will you mark? You can use the marker pen. From the center of the specimen, you take, suppose you are you are planning to have gauge length of 50 millimeter. So from the center of the specimen, find out the center of the specimen, the length direction. The center, you take 25 mm on this side and 25 mm on this side. So you make a mark, a metal using a marker pen, you mark on the specimen. So that is the gauge length. So the gauge length is known. Then after testing, after failure, you uh, keep the specimen together. And you measure what is the change in the gauge length. 
So that is the L. The delta L is nothing but change in the gauge length. What is the L? L is the final. Maybe it's a final length of gauge length and minus initial gauge length divided by over initial gauge length is given by the average genius time. So the, please understand it is average. It's whatever you measure after fracture, you measure and if you find out, then it is the average linear strain. And uh, what are the factors? There are many factors that will influence the uh, uh, influence the magnitude of stress strain curve. Okay, the stress strain curve is not same for all the materials, or the appearance is not same for the, all the materials. So the material properties like composition, chemical composition, the heat treatment which was carried, and the plastic deformation, clear history of plastic. Formation. Plastic deformation means how the material is made, whether it's using a rolling process, a forging process, or extrusion process. So these plastic deformation was and strain rate. This also will affect, as it all know, how much load you are acting, how much the loading rate that also will affect. And then test conditions like uh, strain rate, temperature, state of stress, all those things will affect this shape of the curve. And the tensile strength, as I explained earlier. So it is ultimate, normally it is referred as ultimate UPS, ultimate tensile strength. And uh, UPS is the maximum load divided by the original cross section area. So the maximum load that is the middle can withstand, that you can note it down from the graph or from the doing the test time itself, you can note it down and that divided by the initial original cross section area. Initial means before testing, you measure the diameter if it is a cylindrical space. You measure the thickness and width of the specimen if it is the sheet specimen or flat specimen. Okay, so that area you know that you can calculate pi by 4 d square for cylindrical specimen, and the width and the thickness is the area for the sheet specimen or the flat specimen. Area is known, maximum load is known, divided by that, that will give the <coughs> ultimate tensile strength. <coughs> For yielding, so though it is uh, tensile strength is important to evaluate, easy to evaluate, but for the design purpose, all the designers they will use the yield strength as the uh, design uh, strength, design parameter. Uh, because the reason is why the designers always prefer the yield strength value is yield strength means what? That is the point at which the Plastic deformation starts, the beginning of plastic deformation. Plastic deformation will set or will start from that point, yield point. Plastic deformation means what? Plastic deformation is nothing but it is a permanent deformation. Permanent deformation. There are two deformations. One is uh, temporary deformation, that is called elastic deformation. Other one is called plastic deformation, which is called as the permanent deformation. So elastic deformation is under the below the yield point the deformation what are the deformation occur that is called the elastic deformation why it is called temporary deformation if the load which is acting on the specimen is removed or released then the specimen will come back to its original position original dimensions there will not be any change in dimensions because of the load below the yield point so that's why it is called temporary deformation. Until the load is acting on the specimen, the specimen is deformed. Once the load is remo removed or released, then the specimen will come back to its original dimensions. So that is why it is called the temporary deformation. Generally, it's in technically it is called take the elastic deformation. After the just in the yield point, the material starts deforming plastically. So once the plastic deformation occurs, even if you remove the load, even if you release the load, the specimen will not come back to its original dimensions, original positions, original geometries. So there will be here some permanently deformation has taken place. So that's why the yield point is very, very essential. So in the design, the designers want there should not be any change in the dimensions. Even if the failure occurs, there should not be any change in the failure. So they want to take yield point is the safe side. So you design all the component design well below the yield strength. 
So the yield strength, finding yield strength in the point is very, very challenging one as far as the tensile test is concerned because the reason is uh, many materials, they will not give a definite yield point. It's very, very difficult to identify where the yielding starts, plastic deformation starts. Only few materials, few alloys will give, will indicate for the definite yield point. There will be in the stress strain curve, if you look into that, there will be a small uh, jump in the, uh, the, uh, the stress strain curve. I'll show that later. Right so here, uh, yielding, yield, yield, yield strengths, there are uh, many terms people use. Uh, true elastic limit, proportional limit. Proportional limit is nothing but the highest stress at which stress is proportional to strain. Okay, that is the maximum stress. Beyond that, that it's not proportional. Stress is not proportional to strain. Okay, so from zero, from the starting point to this stress, the pro proportional limit until that point, Stress is directly proportional to strain. Directly proportional means what? Stress increases, strain also increases. Elastic limit, that's a very important. Elastic limit is the greatest stress the material can withstand without any measurable strain after unloading. So elastic limit is always greater than the proportional, uh, proportional limit. So this is very important. This uh, elastic limit is greatest stress. Greatest means maximum stress. The material can withstand without any measurable strain after unloading. So, load it and after unload it, you measure the elongation or something in the specimen. If there is no elongation, then that is the elastic limit. It is within the elastic. Limit. But if you find any small, even 0.1 or 0 0.05 elongation or the change strain in the specimen, then the elastic limit is crossed. So that is the maximum stress the material can withstand without any measurable permanent strain after unloading. Yield strength is the stress required to produce a small specific amount of deformation. That means a small deformation, 0 0.05 or 0 0.001. Okay, that's the strain. Strain is what is the change in length by original length. So that ratio, this ratio, change in length by virtual length, if it is 0 0.001 minimum, at least you are able to measure, then the yield strength is, that is the yield strength point. So these are the uh, yield strength of the material normally given by, you find out the uh, yield point, and you, there are many uh, people use different uh, method to find out the uh, yield point. So some people use 0 0.001 as the strain, 0 0.002 as the strain. So if you use 0.001, it is 0.1 percentage of strain. It is it's normally people say, you see here in this graph, it is a 0 0.01. The uh, green line, light green line is 0.1 percent strain, 0.1 percent strain. So that is whenever you, may, you, you take that as the uh, strain, that's a load, that load divided by the the initial cross sectional area. Initial cross sectional area. So, here for engineering stress and engineering strain, you have to use always initial cross sectional area. Initial cross sectional area at gauge length of the specimen. You cannot use the, the instantaneous area. So, initial, initially, what is the cross sectional area of the specimen before loading the specimen? What is the cross sectional area that you have to take and that will be used to calculate this? Only to find out the load. The yielding load or yield point, you use either 0.1 strain or 0.2 strain. So 0.1, 0.2 means in x axis you take, it will be in the number 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So 0 0.1 and draw a parallel line parallel to this original stress strain curve. And you see that where it intersects in the, the original stress strain curve, that point is the yield load or yield point. So that load you take this or you take that load and substitute here P. 0 0.002 or 0 0.001, you substitute here and divide that, you will get the yield point. So, yield strength of the material, there are uh, uh, many methods they are using it. Um, you can improve the yield strength of the material by cold working. Uh, by doing the cold working, you can improve the material, say so yield strength of the material. You can see in the uh, second diagram how this cold working, cold working is what, is what? it is the whatever you do the work, any working. Whether you do rolling or forging or extrusion below the recrystallization temperature, that's called the 
cold war thing below the recrystallization temperature. So all the materials, they have a recrystallization temperature. The recrystallization temperature is normally 0.6 to 0.8, the melting temperature. When you know the melting point of the material, multiply it by 0.6 or 0.7 or 0.8. So the recrystallization will start at the temperature. So if you do the working, any working, rolling, extrusion, forging, below the temperature, then it is called cold working. Above the recrystallization temperature, it is called the hot working. So if you do the cold working, okay, if you do your rolling process, if you do your forging process, or if you do your extrusion process, the yield strength of the material will be enhanced. You can see in the second. So if you do the 20% cold work, what is happening in the yield point? This is the yield point. If you do the 50% cold work, then the yield point is increased to this point. So yield strength, yield point uh, can be shifted or yield strength can be improved by work hardening or cold working method. Okay, so this is a method of improving the, if you see that pure aluminum and uh, aluminum alloy. It's a uh, aluminum, pure aluminum is 100% pure aluminum, but aluminum alloy is some alloying additions like uh, there are many alloy grades are there, eight different grades of alloys, aluminum alloys are there, adding alloy element, magnesium, zinc, or magnesium, silicon. So based on the grade, you can add that, then the you can change the young small dust, and also you can change the yield strength. Right, this uh, yield strength of the material, it's also affected, it's a uh, yield point phenomena, it's a, a big phenomena in the uh, especially in the BCC materials rather than in the SCC material. As I told in the beginning, right? So this, the third graph, if you see the third picture here, uh, there is um, the stress strain curve. There is, they have mentioned that it's a yield point elongation is taking place. So there is a, a jet when you measure the load displacement graph or stress strain graph, you will find out there is a small change in the uh, slope of the curve that point is the yielding starts. So this type of phenomena will occur only in few materials, not in all the materials. And uh, the condition is to occur, this type of yield point phenomena is, uh, it's it normally to occur in the polycrystalline materials. And the polycrystalline materials, which are having interstitial, uh, interstitial solutes, there are the five interstitial elements are there. Uh, normally, it is uh, carbon is one interstitial element, carbon, nitrogen, boron, hydrogen, oxygen. These are the five interstitial elements that will be added into the material. So if you take iron, in the iron, if you add carbon, then it becomes steel. Okay. Similarly, you can add iron, boron also in the iron. So it is, you can get the, um, iron, the steel and then uh, nitrogen. You can remove some portion of the carbon and you can add nitrogen. So it, is, it will also become, it will act as the interstitial element. The interstitial element means, so you see here the red colored balls. So these are the uh, elements, atoms, ion atoms, for example, ion atoms. In between these atoms, there is a gap, okay, small gap. Three atoms, there is a gap. So that gap will be occupied by the interstitial elements like carbon, boron, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, if you add into that element. So the, these interstitial elements will give, will increase the, it will give a pinning effect during the deformation and they raise the yield strength of the material. So if the material contains these interstitial elements, then this type of phenomena, yield point phenomena will occur. Yield point phenomena means what? It is not a smooth curve, stress strain curve. It is not a smooth low displacement curve what I showed in the previous slide. So here all, if you see that, these curves are smooth curves. So here you cannot find where the yielding is taking place, where the yield point, where the yielding occurs. There is no uh, location or there is no indication. But in this graph, if you see that, the third graph, there is an indication. So this will occur only in few materials, especially in the, even in the steel, low carbon steels will show this uh, yield point phenomena. And then the, the, the stress strain curve will take its original deviation. So here, no need to apply. If you get the graph like this, stress strain graph like this, there is no need to apply 0.2 or 0.1. That concept offset yield strength is not required to apply here. Directly, you can take, let's say, the 
as lowest that uh, upper yield point as you can take it as the uh, upper yield strength and the lower yield point you can take it as a lower yield strength and average in between that you can take the the yield strength or yield point of the right so this is about uh, <coughs> uh, yield strength and ductility is another parameter which is essential <coughs> um why it is essential because ductility is very important um, with the, the material behavior mechanical property uh, because all the metal forming operations metal forming operations uh, based on this ductility if the metal is highly ductile the material is easy to deform easy to form any forming forging rolling extrusion deep drawing cup drawing all the forming operations you can do very easily but if the ductility is low if the ductility is low it is very difficult to deform okay so you should know what is the ductility is so it is a qualitative property of material it's not a quantitative property like uh, yield strength or tensile strength or practice strength it is a qualitative property so we will see that little later and how the, the ductility will be measured there are two uh, parameters that will be normally used one is the uh, elongation percentage of elongation other one is reduction in cross sectional area so these are the formulas used lf is nothing but final gauge length please understand it is the gauge length the final gauge length after fracture you keep the specimen together and measure the gauge length that is the final gauge length before testing you measure the gauge length you are fixing the gauge length 50 mm or 100 mm or 70 mm whatever even 30 mm or so small specimen you can fix 30 mm also so that is what what are the length you are fixing that is the initial gauge length and final gauge length minus initial gauge length divided by initial gauge length is the percentage of elongation and reduction in area yes that is also a ductility parameter to so measure the diameter of the specimen okay initially and calculate the area of the specimen after fracture at the fracture point measure the diameter again using the digital vernier Digital vernier caliper, you measure the what is the diameter again, or if it is a sheet thickness or sheet specimen or plate specimen, to find out what is the thickness, okay, what is the width to measure and calculate the area. So that's the initial area minus final area divided by initial area will give the reduction in cross sectional area. So these two parameters are uh, will explain you what is the ductility is. Suppose if the elongation and the elongation, the elongation is high. I am getting 30% elongation in one material. Another material, I am getting only 10% elongation. So what do you infer from this? The material which gives 30% elongation is highly ductile. Highly ductile means higher elongation. So it is easy to deform. Even at a small load, you can deform it. But if you have elongation is 10% or less than that, this, this material is less ductile material or low ductile material. It will require higher load for the elongate for deformation. Similarly, in the reduction in cross sectional area, cross sectional area reduction, higher the cross sectional area reduction, 50%, 60%, then you can understand that it is more. Similarly, if the reduction in cross sectional area is 10%, 5%, then the ductility is very less. So the uh, the ductility is mainly to find out. The brittleness of the material, whether it is the, the how much is the ductile, how much is the brittle, whether it is falling under this which category. You can. So there are other derived equations you can use that, but this simple equation will do. And modulus of elasticity, as I told in the beginning, um, you have to take the stress-strain graph or even load displacement graph. Even if you don't, if your machine is not giving load displacement graph, you measure, you take the, that graph and find out the slope. Okay. Slope is nothing but dy by dx. This this height, y axis, what is this height, and x axis, this is what is the height. You will find out the ratio. Uh, ratio of this uh, y axis height and the uh, ratio of the x axis height will give the Young's modulus. Young's modulus is very very important property. Okay, it is uh, it will it is a structure insensitive property. If you people know if by doing heat treatment by changing the microstructure, it will not change. Young's modulus will not change. That's why if you see the Young's modulus of uh, steel, all the steels now, the, the uh, Young's modulus will remain almost same, whatever the steel it is. Okay? 
you even it is having a different microstructure hence modulus is almost same it is around uh, 207 gigapascal gpa 2200 200 to 210 gpa that is the steel similarly for aluminum alloys any aluminum alloy the uh, the modulus of velocity x modulus is something around 70 to 75 gigapascal it will not vary much so it is a structure insensitive property you cannot change n modulus but you can improve by forming composites only slightly affected by the alloying addition heat treatment or forward but temperature will have an effect if the temperature increases young modulus will decrease higher the temperature the lower the young modulus okay so what is the use of this young modulus young modulus is an indication to know that what is the stiffness of the material how stiff the material is stiffness is the how stiff is the material is. so why is stiffness is important because stiffness will decide the deflection deflection in the material so all the materials when you apply the load they will undergo some deflection okay that deflection you can that will be governed by controlled by the stiffness of the material so if you want to know the stiffness of the material stiffness is nothing but equal to the young modulus of the material so stiffness is high young modulus is high stiffness will be higher if stiffness is high of the material then deflection will be lower okay so this is why the modulus of elasticity is very very important resilience another important property it is very um, uncommon uh, behavior of the material but it is again no it's, uh, it's, uh, formulas are there even if you don't use the formula you can uh, you can get the um, this elastic region area under the curve as i told no, in the beginning in the stress strain curve you have two areas one is elastic region other one is plastic region elastic region is up to yield point that's called the elastic region beyond the yield point that's called the plastic region so the area under the curve in the elastic region okay area under the curve in the elastic region is called the modulus of resilience how you calculate this one what is this if you if you see this graph if you see into the picture it look it is almost looks like a, a triangle okay it looks like a triangle what is the formula to find you calculate the area of the uh, triangle of bh half into bh okay half b means what x axis and h is what y axis b is here strain y axis is y axis it's a uh, height is uh, stress so half into stress into strain in the elastic region so yield is stress okay yield is stress stress is nothing but yield stress and the strain is the elastic strain yield is strain so multiply these two by two that will give the modulus of the strain so you can either you can if you know uh, yield stress and the yield strain straight away you can calculate the modulus of resilience or uh, if you have the stress strain graph in the stress strain graph if you locate if you if you if you fix the uh, yield point then you find out the area you can measure the area in the graph sheets and you can find out the what is the area that area is nothing but uh, resilience modulus of resilience what is the modulus of resilience it is defined as the ability of a material to absorb energy when in the plastic in the elastic region okay how much energy a material can absorb in the within the elastic region so that is known as the resilience resilience of the material please understand it is energy absorption there is a two different energy absorption i will come to the next slide will explain to you energy absorbed in the elastic region energy absorbed in the plastic region energy absorbed in the plastic re elastic region is called as the resilience elastic the, the energy absorbed in the plastic region is called as the different name there is toughness toughness is energy absorbed in the plastic region so here resilience means please understand within the elastic region how much energy material is absorbing so that is known as the resilience okay so here uh, some of the values of the resilience are given here young modulus and the, uh, the yield stress and modulus of resilience are given here and um, toughness yes so as I told, no toughness is the energy absorbed in the plastic range, the ability to withstand occasional stresses, above yield stress, with fracture. That's also toughness. But generally, 
it is the energy absorption within the plastic region okay so as i told you have two region elastic region and plastic region if you know the area of the curve under the elastic region that is resilience and the area under the curve in the um, the plastic region is called the toughness so you can calculate you can measure using the stress strength and also you can calculate or you can use this formula and you can calculate the how much is the toughness so toughness this toughness is different from the impact toughness so don't get confused with that impact toughness is different because their loading rate is different okay the pendulum will come and hit we will discuss later the, the that toughness and this toughness is different toughness is there also it is the energy is absorbed in the plastic region but there the loading rate is different here the loading rate is very very low here it is a very low strain rate here so this toughness and uh, stiffness it's very important because if you see that there are two steels are compared here the stress strain curve of two material is uh, compact here one is structural steel ordinary uh, steel structural steel mild steel you can take it as a mild steel and other steel is called the spring steel okay spring steel so what is the difference you can observe from this stress strain curve if you see that uh, the, the difference is the area under the curve so in this structural steel okay in the uh, structural steel the elastic region is very very small very very narrow okay so when compared to the total area total area under the curve so the total area under the curve is very wide okay so the plastic deformation is enormous a large plastic deformation the area is area under the curve the plastic region is very tiny but the elastic region is very low but at the same time you see that another steel spring steel in the spring steel the elastic region is again okay it's a small elastic region and the plastic region also it's not as in the structural steel so the high carbon steel what you infer that the structural steels are tough materials structural steels are tough materials why it is tough material because the plastic region is very wide at the same time the spring steels are stiff material stiffness is very high how i am saying it is the stiffness is very high the elastic region is high larger than compared to the structural steel so you have to for stiffness measurement you have to compare the elastic region for toughness measurement you have to compare the the plastic region so in the structural steel like mild steel the toughness is more but in the spring steel though it is a stronger steel high strength steel okay spring steel is high strength steel compared to the structural steel but the stiffness is high in the case of spring steel but at the same time toughness of the spring steel is less toughness of the spring steel is less because it is having it is showing only the plastic region is very very small and compared to the the structural steel material so this is this difference you should understand right so coming back coming to the next one that's a, what is whatever we discussed so far engineering stress and engineering strain and uh, the properties related to engineering stress and engineering strain curve so i will go back to the first slide uh, i think yeah we i told sir sorry introduction yeah sir in the bottom uh, just you can click hide sir because it is uh, oh it is not uh, hide hide, hide, hide. Yeah. please sir, now please go ahead sir so in the here i told about this first three strength evaluation reduction young smaller stiffness and toughness so all this eight properties you can derive from a simple tension test where you have the you are getting the stress strain engineering stress engineering strain curve that is enough that will give all this properties eight properties but the last two properties if you want to evaluate you cannot evaluate from the directly from the engineering stress strain curve so you have to convert that engineering stress strain curve into true stress true strain curve why by converting the engineering stress strain curve into true stress true strain curve then you will get the these two important property because these two properties are very important for the metal working or metal forming this concern people those who are working metal forming they, they can understand why these two properties is important so okay what is the true stress and true strain the only difference is there for calculating stress whether it's the yield stress 
or tensile stress or fracture stress we are using well, the formula is one load by area is stress okay we we'll keep it it's, it's everybody knows load by area is stress okay so in the load divided by area that area there if you want to find out yield stress you are using yield load if you want to find out tensile stress you are taking the tensile load and if you want to find out the fracture stress you are taking the fracture load but area is remains same a not a not is initial area but in the true stress strain true stress true strain curve you cannot use the area initial area you have to use here instantaneous area because area is continuously changing the the, the, the gauge length so you can, the, if you look in you know, observe that the, the gauge length the uniformly it undergoes deforms okay so there is a change in length change in diameter okay if the change in length occurs definitely there is a change in the the strain if the change in diameter occurs there is a change in the cross sectional area so if you want to measure yield to stress then you have to take exactly when you are taking yield point what is this the diameter is there and you have to calculate the uh, area that you have to use so this is a true stress strain curve is uh, plotted based on the instantaneous area of the specimen so engineering stress strain curve stress drops down after nicking since it is based on vosel area because if you see that there is a two drops here one is the uh, the down one bottom one is for the engineering stress strain curve this is the true stress true strain curve what why it is dropping after making after maximum load because here the the stress is load is dropping once the load is dropping but area we are using same area initial area we are using to calculate what is the stress so that's why it is dropping but in the true stress constant curve what why it is increasing keep on increasing is yes. okay after making also you are taking after making what is the diameter what is the area for that area what is the stress you are you are calculating that you are plotting here that's why the curve is going up here so this is the basic difference and the relationships were developed or derived to relate engineering stress and true stress and engineering strain and true stress so normally the true stress is um, given by sigma notation is sigma the sigma is given by if you take this s into e plus 1 E is what strain. S is what stress. S is small s is engineering stress. Small e is engineering strain. So in strain plus one multiplied by stress that will give the true stress. Similarly, the e is strain. E plus one and natural log. If you take natural log for that, and that will give the true strain. So in both, you no. Know, if you want to find out true stress and true strain, you should know what is e plus one. E plus one. E is what engineering strain. Engineering strain is what the final uh, final for final length minus uh, original length divided by original length. That is the strain. Okay, that's the engineering strain. L F minus L naught by L naught is the engineering strain. That is very important property. So if you know that after fracture, so if you find out this and then you multiply. If you want to prove stress, you multiply by engineering stress. And here you take natural logarithm to get the true strain. It's a very simple relationship. If you remember this relationship, so each point in the in the engineering stress strain curve at each point, you know the stress, you know the strain, and substitute here, and you will get the true stress. Now you construct the graph. The graph will be curve will be like this. So again, it is um, uh, the true stresses at maximum load, true stress at maximum load, ultimate strain will be slightly changed. This is the ultimate tensile strain. Okay, maximum load divided by initial area. True stress at maximum load is you see the difference between the the both of these two formulas. P max load is maximum maximum load, but area is different. What is A U at maximum load? What is the cross sectional area? That is the you have to substitute here. Then that is the true stress. And similarly, true strain at maximum load is this is what we are getting it here. A not by A U. The strain at the A U is nothing but strain at The maximum load. So that ratio will give the um, true strain at maximum load. Okay. So this is the uh, relationships are derived to correlate how you can get true stress, true strain from engineering stress and engineering strain. So if you know engineering stress, you can get true strain. If you know 
the engineering strain, you can get this. So engineering stress, engineering strain is average stress, average strain. So people normally use, they will not use engineering stress, engineering strain. They say average stress, average strain. So if they say average stress, average strain, it is the engineering stress, engineering strain. They, that means what? They used initial cross-sectional area. Area, whatever the area you are using, initial gauge length. So they use it. But in the two stress and two strain, you have to use instantaneous area, instantaneous length for calculation. Okay, this uh, again it is a fracture stress. Again, you calculate the P fracture and the A fracture. Fracture stress at the fracture, what is the area that you have to compute here? And two fracture signs similar, similarly here. And uh, only important thing is here, right? So the same graph is repeated here. And uh, yes, this is very important. Uh, from this, okay, sir. Uh, I have engineering stress strain curve. From engineering stress strain curve, I have got a true stress, true strain. So what next I do? How I will get the uh, thing, uh, the strain coordinate exponent and strain coefficient? So these values, true stress value and true strain value, you you you, you plot it in the log log sheet. So you see this graph. Okay, y-axis is uh, true stress sigma. Okay. Uh, sigma is nothing but S into E plus 1. E plus 1, you remember. Okay, E plus 1 is our engineering strain plus 1. That you multiply by engineering stress that will give the uh, true stress. So, true stress in the y axis, you take the log log sheet. And true strain, what is true strain? E plus 1 again. You take natural logarithm for strain, that you will get the uh, true strain. So, you plot those values in the x axis. So, if you plot all this data, you will get and those data you fit it by the best fit line best fit straight line okay so just like this you connect it by a best fit line you will get a straight line you will get a straight line with some slope with okay? some slope so the slope of the curve is the n okay slope of the curve after plotting this two stress to sign you have to connect and you will get a curve like this the slope of the curve. Slope means what as I told you the beginning from the beginning I'm saying slope is nothing but dy by dx. Change in y, change in divided by change in x. So here they use change in y is a and change in x is b they are taking and a by b they are getting n. n is the, the slope of the curve. That is slope of the curve is n is the strain hardening exponent. What is um, the uh, strength coefficient? You have to find out what is the intercept of the curve. What is the intercept of the curve? You extend this curve and you find out where it intercepts in the x axis and there it becomes 1. So it is the, the y become 1 and x where it interacts and that is called the, uh, the intercept of the equation. So now a uh, lot of uh, softwares are there. Even the, um, the where you are drawing using the software for drawing the graphs, that itself will give the equation, power equation. So that is the, you will get the intercept. Okay, so the slope is the strength strain of the exponent, and the intercept of the curve is the strength coefficient. Okay, by combining this, you can um, reform the one power equation was developed. Sigma, that is the true stress, is equal to uh, k into epsilon power n. Epsilon is true strain. So sigma is true stress, and epsilon is true strain power n. Power n is the strain of the exponent, and k is the intercept of the strength coefficient of the intercept. That is, this is nothing but u y equal to x power m into c. That's a, the general formula. Y equal to m x plus c is for uh, linear graph or linear curve. Okay, linear equation. Y equal to m x plus c is the linear equation. Y equal to x power m into c. X power m into c is the power equation. So here they have derived the power equation because they are constructing the log log sheet, so they are using the power equation. So this is the flow curve equation or power equation for, for flow behavior. So this is a very, very important equation. So N and K is the material property. Okay, so N is the strain coordination. So what is the use of this N, sir? If you see this curve, this graph, second graph, if N is zero, what will happen? If N equal to one, what will happen? Okay. N is what? Is the slope. If slope is 0 means what? As it all know, y by x. y by x is slope. So if we n, we, we n is 0 means what? x is 0. 
Okay, so this is you will get here n equal to zero means perfectly plastic solid, perfectly plastic solid. N equal to one. If you see that n equal to one, when n equal to one, when it will become n equal to one, slope will become one. The y component dy and dx, dy and dx is equal, y axis and x axis, this a and b is equal. Then n will become one. So when it will become one, so it should be 45 degree. 45 degree exactly from 0 to 45 degree the drop with the curve goes then it is n equal to 1 it is for the elastic solid okay it is for the elastic solid but normally what are the metals we are using it for engineering applications the value n of n value is varying from 0.1 to 0.5 okay 0.1 to 0.5 it's not uh, more than 0.5 and uh, uh, less than uh, or not zero okay it will be varying from this n from here to here, n to 0.1 to 0 0.5 between this region, the top region, not in the bottom region, the top region, the most of the material will have this property. So there are a different variation of this power flow equation. Modification was done by the further uh, development, further researchers. So the one of the equations, Ludwig equations. So they have added you no know, k epsilon power n. This so plus they added the yield stress, sigma naught is the yield stress, and similarly. For arsenic stainless steel, for each material you can develop, for different material, for different uh, structures, you can um, develop the equation. But the base equation is sigma equal to k into epsilon power 1, this is the power equation, flow curve equation. It will be, this is the equation that is the governing equation for the true stress, true strain curve. It is nothing but, it is a governing equation for the true stress, true strain curve. How will you get the true stress, true strain curve? From engineering stress strain curve, convert that. Uh, engineering stress into true stress, engineering strain into true strain, and plot the graph. That curve, graph, that curve is governed by the flow curve equation. The slope of the equation, the curve is strain hardening expert, and the intercept of the curve is the uh, strength coefficient. Right. So this is uh, instability in tension because now the ideal plastic material undergo necking after yielding with no strain hardening. Most metal, but most of the metals, necking begins at maximum load, with strain hardening increasing, load carrying capacity. So most of the metals, common metal, because ideal plastic material, we are not using it. Uh, the, most of the metals, what we are using it, they will start the necking. Necking means, as I told you, it's a, the, the, uh, the, some instability will occur. Okay, so this is necking or localized deformation starts at maximum load. Which is opposed by decrease in cross section area of the specimen as it evolves. So, instability, when it will occur, increase in stress due to reduced cross section area. Because the necking start means what? The reduction in cross section area occurs. You see that the first specimen, the second specimen, there is a reduction in cross section area. But the load is the load, load is the same load you are maintaining. Okay? And that's whatever load you are applying initially, you are maintaining, you are not reducing the load. So load is higher, but the area is less. Because of that, stress is increasing. So that is called the increase in stress due to reduced cross section area. That should be greater the increase in load carrying capability due to strain hardening. Because of this, like the here, what happens? There is a work hardening is taking place. The deformation is what you are doing the test at room temperature. So it is your cold working process. You are stressing the material. You are straining the material. That straining is what it is the uh, what you call strain hardening. Because of straining, the metal will get hardened. Even because of the hardening, the load carrying capability is increasing. So this this capability is less than this than instability will uh, occur. There are uh, K, K values and N values for uh, different materials. So for steel itself, no, you have different percentage uh, because it is the uh, material dependent property, copper and uh, brass. And we have different n value, different k value. You can see that it's almost uh, less than 0.5 in all the cases. And k is we have different values, k values. And uh, the necking uh, stress distribution, how the stress distribution in the necking? Because there is uh, two type of things will happen. Uh, if it is the thin specimen, uh, the this condition, if you see the play, uh, elastic stresses beneath the notch. So at uh, the notch, the stress will be maximum, tip of the notch. You are making a notch, it may be a sharp notch, it may be a V notch, it may be a blunt notch, whatever the notch it is, at the tip of the notch, 
the stress will be maximum because of stress concentration. There is a stress concentration. Stress concentration is higher at the point, so maximum stress will be there. And uh, the away from the notch, the stress will decrease. If you go away from the notch, the stress will be decreasing. So that is given by this stress gradient lines. So in the y-axis, how the stress is distributed, the x-axis, how the stress is distributed, the z-axis, how the stress is distributed. So if you have only two, two axes, you are measuring it in the X and Y axis. The third dimension is not important. Okay, thickness is not important. Then it is plain stress condition, plain stress condition. Plain strain condition is X axis, Y axis, and Z axis. The thick specimens, normally thick specimens, will have this um, plain strain condition, will fall into this plain strain condition. But thin specimens will fall into the plain stress condition, X and Y axis alone, the stress distribution. Z axis, it is very, very minimum, very, very minimum. So, but in the thick specimens, you have three axes, the stress distribution, X, Y, and Z axis is minimum. So, here in the, see that at the tip of the notch, maximum stress will occur in the Y direction, and X direction is slightly away from the notch, the maximum stress will occur. So, this plain stress, plain strain, we will discuss elaborately in the fracture toughness behavior, there again it will come. And ductility measurement, as you told, no, it's uh, elongation measuring the gauge length only you have to take. You have to consider the uh, ductility, that's a, a gauge length you have to measure. <coughs> and it is um, dimensional gauge length again, right? So the standard gauge length is, you can get you know, 5.6 square root of A as per the standard. So you, here they have given you know, the ASTM standards and the other things we have given here, sheet specimen, round specimen. So you can calculate, if you know the area, uh, with respect to area, you can fix the gauge length. Gauge length should be fixed based on the diameter of the specimen or the area of the specimen. Okay, so you have to fix, use this uh, relationship, 5.65 square root of A. The cross section area, you can find out 5 by 4 D square is the cross section area. So substitute in the equation, whatever the value comes, that you should maintain as a gauge length. Okay. And uh, difference between elongation and the reduction area. So it's, uh, reduction area is uh, structure sensitive property, ductility parameter, but elongation is the strain hardening capacity of the material. It is having dependent on the strain hardening material. <coughs> uh, both are for the um, ductility measurement. So finally, I will take another. Uh, can I take another 10 minutes, Nagaran? Hello? Please, sir, please, okay. if you are comfortable, you can go okay, ahead, sir, okay. please. Uh, the strain rate, uh, as I told you in the beginning, uh, the strain rate is, we are fixing, the, when you do the tensile test also, we have to fix the strain rate. Uh, see here, the, in the table, it's not so clear, I don't know. So, uh, the range of strain rate is given, 10 power minus 8 to 10 power minus 5. Okay, creep test. You know the creep test is, uh, we'll discuss, the last lecture I plan to give creep behavior. Creep test is a very, very, very slow test. Okay, and very low test will take longer time. People use the test 10,000 hours. Okay, you calculate how many days this. Okay, so you have to test for one year. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very, very small strain they will apply. And the uh, static tension test, you see the 10 power minus 5 to 10 power minus 1. Okay, so that is the normally for uh, screw driven machine or hydraulic machine, this condition will be applied. The strain rate which is applied for the and it is a, if you go higher, higher strain rate, the so dynamic tension, dynamic test, uh, compression test, n power minus 1 to 10, 10 square. 10 square means what? 100. Okay. And then it is the high speed, 10 square, 100 to 10,000. And 10,000 to 1 crore or 10 crore, hyper velocity impact machine. Law. So the uh, different machines will produce different strain rate. And uh, as far as the tension, tensile test is concerned, we will be using the strain rate in this range, 10 power minus 5 to 10 power minus 1. What is that S power 1 or uh, that is that is given by this uh, strain, you know that strain is, uh, there is no unit, okay, uh, because the numerator also in length scale and denominator also in the length scale, so there is, uh, there is no uh, unit for that. But strain rate is nothing but change in strain with respect to time, change in time. D epsilon by D. Epsilon is strain, change in strain with respect to time, with respect to time, 
what is that? That is the strain there. So it is uh, denoted by epsilon power dot. There is uh, one dot there before the epsilon that is called the strain there. So here for strain, there is no unit. For time, you have unit of so second, one second. So one by s, one by s is s power minus one. So strain rate, what is the uh, effect of strain rate? If you use higher strain rate, and you have the higher flow stress, flow stress will be very high. Okay, higher strain rate, definitely the flow stress will be high. And if you raise the temperature, again, it is the strain rate dependent. You can see this graph, in the graph strain rate versus the stress versus strain rate <coughs> for different temperature, different temperature. So this is the type, uh, strain rate is uh, temperature dependent property. And uh, strain rate sensitivity, that's another uh, parameter which is uh, very important. Strain rate sensitivity. Strain rate sensitivity indicates any changes in deformation behavior. Measurement of strain rate sensitivity can be linked to dislocation concept. It's a velocity of uh, mobile dislocations. And it is uh, given by this equation. The sigma equal to C into uh, strain rate power M. So it is this. <coughs> So whether a material is sensitive to strain rate or not, that is very, very essential because you can apply any strain rate. You can apply low strain rate or medium strain rate or high strain rate, whether the material is sensitive to the strain rate. Okay, some materials are highly sensitive, some materials are less sensitive. So highly sensitive materials means for a given change in small strain rate, there is a, at the deformation, the flow behavior is very different. So if there's whatever the strain rate you apply, the flow figure will not change. Okay, there's two conditions. One is if you change the strain rate, the flow behavior is entirely different. Okay, but whatever the strain rate you apply, the flow behavior is almost similar. Then it is less sensitive. So high strain rate sensitivity is characteristics of super plastic metals in the life. So you know you hear about the super plastic behavior and super at least you hear about super plastic metals in the life. So there, this uh, strain rate sensitivity is very, very important. The metals and alloys which are highly sensitive to the strain rate sensitivity, they are a good ideal uh, uh, candidate material for the super plastic material. So if you see here, the titanium alloy is ideal material for uh, super plastic forming. And uh, because of that only, they, are, they have high uh, strain rate sensitivity here. So the MS, the, the strain rate, uh, Sensitivity, which is varying with the elongation that is plotted here. Effect of temperature on flow property, uh, it's, it's uh, well known. Temperature increases, definitely the strength will drop. You don't expect strength will increase. Okay, the metal becomes softened or alloy becomes softened. And the strength, the water of the strength, the yield of strength, tensile strength, uh, okay, fracture strength, all the strength will decrease. The room temperature strength is always higher. At high temperature strength, the always lower. What are the material? Even it is a super fast, super uh, super alloys like nickel based alloys. Okay, that's uh, they are good material for high high temperature application. But still, to measure the temperature at room temperature and measure the temperature at 600 or 800 degrees centigrade will be always lower than that. So this is if you see here, uh, change, change this, uh, this graph will explain to you just as a strain. And the uh, that low temperature, the strength is very high. At low temperature means even sub zero temperature. At room 25 degrees centigrade is room temperature. 400 degrees centigrade is high temperature. So, low temperature, this is room temperature and high temperature. So, when the temperature increases, all the strength, yield strength, tensile strength, factor strength, all the strength will decrease. And uh, the ductility, yes, ductility will increase. Ductility will increase because you now that it's a metal becomes softened, so the elongation and deformation is more, the temperature is high. And these are the effects of temperature on yield strength for different alloys. It's given for different alloys. Only for the super alloys, you have high ductility at a high temperature. And it is uh, effects of temperature on ductility, effect of temperature on yield strength. And the comparison of mechanic properties of various temperature. Okay, so it's known as the homogeneous temperature. It is it's given by the testing temperature divided by the melting temperature. That's known as the homogeneous temperature uh, because this ratio 
that is expressed in degrees per kelvin so this is no what because no some conditions you have to do nowadays no if you are working on titanium alloys nickel base alloys you know also need to industry you need to evaluate the the the, the, um, the high temperature properties hot tensile properties you have to do hot tensile properties hot tensile properties generally different because you need uh, the heating chamber furnace is required and uh, the furnace means is not ordinary furnace then you have to change in the enter uh, fixers everything is you have to change and uh, so the uh, test temperature and melting temperature each material you have the melting temperature you know that that ratio is given as the homogeneous temperature and this should be compared in terms of uh, sigma by e that's the ns modulus by e stress we can right another thing is uh, notch tensile test this is what the people are doing because especially uh, it is the welded joint welded components uh, we don't we, when you do the welded joint and uh, test the tensile specimen then uh, prepare the tensile specimen and they do that test sometimes the failure will occur away from the weld okay away from the weld it may fail in the hs region or it may fail in the uh, base metal region so uh, it may fail based on the what welding process you use what filler uh, material you are using weld material you are using so i want to know what is exactly at the point weld the point or weld the location what is that i want to know what is the strength at the heat of the zone i will if i if people are working out of people are working on it in the world interruption yeah ah uh, sir in your which slide sir uh, strain rate sensitivity yeah the same slide or you you on some other slide sir yeah same i think this that's uh, uh, stuck right thing sir sir uh, what is that uh, which slide you are sir now uh this one not sensitive test is not oh, not it, it is not showing sir uh, oh. uh, strain rate sensitivity is still is there okay okay So I, I I I after that I went to one or two slides, three slides. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So I think time is over. Ah, uh, yes, sir. We are going to near five thirty. Yeah. Okay, we are, we will close now. Maybe uh, tomorrow, no. Uh, after fitting, if you have time for this, I'll uh, discuss about this last slide. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, sir. Any any questions? Any clarifications? Yes, sir. Sir, we take two or three questions, sir. A lot of yeah. questions there. Uh, Uh, sir, Mr. Raghu, I am going to ask one question. Ah. Is toughness and strain energy both are same? Toughness and strain energy. Yes. See that as it all know, there is a toughness is. the energy the ability of the material to absorb energy in the plastic region okay it is it's, it's almost equal strain energy means it's a stored energy in the material how much energy it is stored the, that is called the strain energy but here the strain energy is you have elastic strain energy and plastic strain energy so the toughness is related to plastic strain energy under plastic loading condition how much energy it is that's a slight difference This is stored energy, and the but normally that uh, you have the strain energy is uh, it will offer the resistance for the uh, the toughness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have two energy. One is the strain energy is uh, elastic strain energy and plastic strain energy, and the, the, the toughness is related to plastic strain energy, and the stiffness is related to elastic strain energy. So the if you combine these two, then it is a total strain. Energy. Uh, super great sir great sir okay. uh, sir mr karnagada had asked one question mm. uh, does the size and density of grains uh, has effect on ductility size and uh, density of the grains ah uh, yes it's uh, actually no you know that the half pitch relation grain size no uh, uh, the half pitch relation is based on uh, grain size only So it will have an effect on the strength. Definitely, the the grain size will have an effect on the strength, strength and toughness. It is having effect because now the density. I don't understand what is his meaning by density of grain. I think the size of the grains normally we use the term density. Okay, I'll I'll take it as 
If it is a low density, drains are uh, uh, very less in number. Okay, that means what? So in the unit area, number of drains are less. That is one condition. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And sir, another one question. I. Sir, are you able to hear me, sir? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, there is some uh, connectivity issue with uh, VB, sir. Okay. So let us wait for him. And I, th I think almost uh, we planned up to 5.30 as time is over. However, so let us wait for a few minutes, since we will uh, close the session. And uh, the question, whatever you have, uh, tomorrow also you can uh, throw it out, so we can uh, clarify it. That's not an issue. So Chandrasekhar Technology is purely taking this effort uh, to enhance the uh, uh, knowledge of uh, the uh, different community research, community researchers, students, and faculty community. Uh, during this lockdown period, uh, by keeping the motto, uh, the lockdown is only for the uh, nation and maybe uh, worldwide, and there is no lockdown for learning. By keeping this as motto, Channel Short Technology has been taking uh, tremendous effort in conducting webinars. So, uh, we have conducted so many workshops, faculty development programs, and uh, national conference and national and international seminars and this lecture series. Apart from that, so we have conducted, uh, we are going to near the 200 webinar. So daily there will be an webinar apart from this uh, uh, special initiative like a workshop, conferences, accessories. So daily there will be one webinars. So we are soon we are going to near the 200 webinar, 200 webinar in this uh, lockdown period. These webinars are being are conducted as a social responsibility uh, so i think uh, so today we will close the close this session and we will uh, uh, how we will clarify if you have any doubt tomorrow and i this was a very excellent session so uh, we used to uh, see only the uh, stress and graph and we used to remember only what is the yield point, how the making occurs. So he taught uh, uh, much more about the tensile behavior of materials. So I, I hope this might be highly useful for the uh, faculty members, researchers, and of course, few students, maybe one or two students are in this uh, program. So this might be enhancing their uh, research capability, and this will help them to uh, get into further research. And thank you, thank you for your participation. So, uh, as a, there will be there will not be any uh, separate feedback for uh, each session. So totally, uh, one feedback form will be shared at, at the end of the day. And as it was said, your certificate will be uh, will be uh, printed uh, as a soft copy with your uh, photograph, and the and your certificate will have some uh, unique uh, certificate number, and the list of participants will also be updated in our uh, websites so hence uh, the genuinity of the certificates uh, will be uh, will be assured so the duplication of certificate will be avoided uh, so the as uh, the people those who attended the one week uh, faculty development program on purely the fundamental mechanical me fundamentals of mechanical uh, sciences uh, might have seen that their list might be uh, the list of uh, uh, attendees might be available on our websites. So like this, the same way, this certificate will also be printed. So those who have uh, not given the correct photograph, you can personally, you can approach me to replace the existing photograph uh, for uh, better uh, visibility. Okay. Now, thank you so much. So we will meet in the tomorrow session and by uh, uh, 4 o'clock. And mostly, 
the link will be shared by tomorrow 3:30 pm and please join by 3:50 or 3:50 pm at least so if you join later the room will not allow so uh, so today uh, i i i i will look at the error what happened today so that i should that that will not happen again uh, while joining for uh, today's webinar and uh, uh, so those who have not joined in the whatsapp group i request all you to uh, join in the uh, whatsapp group and uh, in hurry some of you have not attached the correct payment proof while submitting your form so if so also those who did not uh, do that please you can approach me personally and you can uh, do that okay. so thank you so much uh, thank you for your wonderful participation we will see in uh, tomorrow maybe tomorrow lecture lecture okay thank you so much